Okay. So, because this is the final talk for quite a while, I'm going to give here in Damaloka, because we're having our retreat period soon. I have to make sure that this talk lasts. So, the title of tonight's talk, it was given to me just a couple of minutes before I came in here, always searching around for something to talk about and following people's suggestions. So, tonight's talk is called, Who's Right? (laughs) Now, it's a great title for a talk because not only does it start to uh, give us some indication Uh, This Friday night, have you come to the correct place? Have you come to the Buddhist center? Should you have gone to the Christian center or the Muslim center or some other spiritual center or gone down to the pub or stayed at home and watched the TV? Have you put your money on the right horse? (laughs) And number two, this is not just spiritual. Because have you ever noticed religious people are always arguing? There are always people arguing which is the right religion or which is the right sect of which religion or which is the right interpretation of this sect of that religion and who is right and how can you find out. Most importantly, are you right? And why is it that not only we have arguments about religion, we have also arguments about everything. Anything is okay to argue about. And when you argue, especially with your loved ones, who's right? (laughs) So we're going to start on that first of all. When you argue with your friends and loved ones, who's right in our monastery? It's very easy to understand who's right because we have monastic rules. And we have the two major rules of our monastery. You can ask any of the monks, Sanagarikas, novices staying there. The first monastic rule is the abbot is always right. (laughs) It makes sense, it's obvious, isn't it? And number two, in case the abbot is wrong, refer back to rule number one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, of course, that's only a joke. That's that's not actually how we we work in a monastery. I remember just growing up, there was these two monks arguing once. And the abbot is a very famous of the forest monks, one of the forest monks. He couldn't decide, you know, who was right, who was wrong. And so he had this visiting monk who's going to be coming in November, we think. And he asked, my goodness, I can't decide who's right and who's wrong. They're arguing about it with each other. And this monk straight away cut to the chase and said something very profound. He said, if they're arguing, they're both wrong. Chuck them both out, <laughs> which he did. <laughs> if you're arguing, you are both wrong. Isn't that a wonderful sort of uh, way of dealing with things? Because it's the argument itself which is wrong. No matter who's right and who's, you know, whether I'm right in my interpretation, my memories, what I think, what somebody else is thinking. The fact we argue that that is something wrong about that. Because one of the great teachings of the Buddha, which again, when you see some of these uh, sayings, they really sort of cut very deeply beyond all theories and ideas. When he said, if it leads, if it's really truth, If it's like Dhamma, is a Buddhist word for truth, it must lead to peace, harmony, happiness, to liberation, to freedom. And if it leads to the opposite things, he said, it's not my teachings. If it leads to contentions, to arguments, to wars, to lack of peace, to lack of freedom, he said, that's not Buddhism. That's not teachings. That's not truth, he was saying. Isn't it a wonderful description of actually a spiritual path. It should be something which leads to peace, to freedom. I think one of the reasons it does that is because it gets to the heart of what spirituality, what life is all about. Instead of relying on some sort of like book, we do have books in Buddhism, but we use those as guidelines. And I always remember just the teaching of, not teaching, a quote of, I think, Voltaire, who said, you know, this was uh, a couple of centuries ago in, in uh, France, which was very strongly Christian at the time, He said, if God was the author of anything, he was the author of human reason rather than any book. I always thought that that if you're saying what truth is, truth doesn't lie in books. You know, truth lies in... I should actually say this because I'm having a book launch in a week or two's time, but (laughs) some books are more truthful than others. (laughs) 
But nevertheless, we never actually rely upon, <laughs> upon books to be the absolute truth. Because if you do, then we always sort of beat each other over the head with our books. You know, the bigger the book, the bigger headache you give to the other person because you hit them over the head with it. But I think we all know now that sort of the, the truth doesn't lie in books. So we can understand the truth for ourselves because we feel, we recognize very often that some teaching, some way of looking at life does actually create more harmony, more peace in our world. And I'd say, I'd say to you now that you, will underst- you can test your understanding of Buddhist teachings now, how well you've understood all that myself, Sister Wayam, and the other monks, nuns who visited here have taught, if you can live at peace and harmony with others, and if you can live in peace and harmony with yourself. That's a sign of understanding what truth truly is. And if you can do that, then you're right. So it doesn't really matter about the theories and the views, what you can espouse around a coffee table with your friends. Sometimes it's all right to do that, have like an argument, but just for argument's sake, just for fun, having a little debate. It doesn't really matter who's right and who's wrong. You just do that for a little bit of fun. But the friendship has to be much stronger than that. That's why sometimes in our monastery, sometimes whoever's the second monk, they may say one thing, and I say the opposite. You know, just for the <laughs> just for the sake of it, just to have a nice little argument, because sometimes arguments uh, we can actually get uh, deeper into the truth of things. But these are your friends, and so whatever happens in that sort of discussion, that friendship is always paramount. And so, if it gets a bit too tough, then I'm the one who says sorry first. Another thing which I learned from my monastic upbringing. The one who is right is not the one who had the correct understanding about Buddhism or about the right theory or whatever. The one who is right is the one who says sorry first. I've seen that in many, many cases. Sometimes monks would have arguments. They're human beings, especially when they're young monks. Even recently, last week in our monastery, there was two Anagarikas. They had a, a falling out. And of course, as soon as I have a falling out, it's on the weekend, so as soon as I came back last week on a Sunday night, they wanted to speak to me. And this, is what, this is called Abbot suffering. <laughs> and he was telling me of all the other things which this person had done, they shouldn't have done this, and they really acted really you know, out of line, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> he was probably right, it probably was the other the Anagarika's fault, but I said, it's your job is to go up to him and ask forgiveness. He said, I can't do that. It was his fault. <laughs> it doesn't matter whose fault it is. The one who's right is the one who asks forgiveness, first of all. Because they're the one who realizes what's most important. It doesn't really matter about you know, being you know, the ego, that I was right, you were wrong. You shouldn't have done that. I did the right thing. What happened in the past is gone. What's important now is actually showing that which leads to freedom, which leads to peace, which leads to harmony, which is an expression of love. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. I remembered at the time because we had a Franciscan monk visiting our monastery a, a week or so ago. And I always remember one of the great stories which I read from the life of St. Francis. It just shows you how ecumenical we really are. That there was this monk who... Actually, Franciscans are very similar to Buddhist monks in the sense that they had no money, they were penniless, and they would go uh, on arms round for their food. And this monk was going on arms round for his food. He met a poor man. And the poor man said, No, I'm more hungry than you are. Can you give me something? And this monk, the only thing he had was his robe. He didn't have any money, no other possessions. So he said, OK, here's my robe. You can go and sell us in the market, get some food, and then you can actually uh, have something to eat today. Here's my robe. So when he came back to the monastery, (laughs) he was naked. (laughs) And as soon as he knocked on the door, get out of here. We don't have crazy people like you. But after a while, they recognized him. Oh, it's you. What happened to your robe? Did he get stolen? No, he explained. He met a very poor man, and the poor man was so hungry. The only thing you had to give him was actually his robe. So he gave him his, his robe. And of course the monk said, oh, that's a very wonderful thing to do. You know, you literally give everything you've got, even the clothes you're wearing. That's a great sort of Christian good thing to do. 
But of course the trouble was that the word gets around, that this monk is a soft touch. So the next time we went on arms round, the same thing happened. Someone asked for his robe again. And so he gave it a second time. And the second time he came back naked. By this time, you know, the monks at that monastery, they were sort of uh, getting to know who he was. So come in, have another robe. But after three or four times of this, we've only got so many robes in the storeroom. So he had to go and see the abbot. And the abbot sort of told him, look, don't do it again. And to impress the fact that he shouldn't do this again, he really gave him a scolding. Now look, these are robes which are given by our supporters. You know, they're supposed to be looked after, cleaned and patched if you need to patch them. But you can't keep giving them away. They're not yours to give away. You can't go around naked. And he really scolded this monk. And all the time he was being scolded, this monk just kept his head down. He was being scolded by the abbot. And when the abbot thought he'd really given him a proper talking to, he dismissed him. Half an hour later, this, no, he didn't come back naked. Half an hour later, he came back with a cup of soup for this abbot. He said, what do, you, what do you give me a cup of soup for? He said, well, you were speaking so loudly for such a long time, I thought you may have a sore throat, so here, have some soup. <laughs> <laughs> and this was not being sarcastic. You know, if you did this in Australia, you probably would be cynical. But this was actually really from the heart. He was never thinking of himself. All he was thinking about was his poor abbot who was talking so much. And so he thought, <laughs> he didn't mind being scolded. He was just compassionate for somebody else. And so after that, the abbot said, oh, just give away the whole story. You can't do anything with a monk like that. <laughs> it didn't really matter who was right and who was wrong, sort of in the worldly sense. What was most right was that fellow just was, you know, wanted to be kind and caring to somebody else. It was the love which was right. So if you ever have an argument, you may have some outstanding arguments with your loved ones, with your children, with your parents, with your husband, your wife, your partner, or with your monk, <laughs> or whatever. It does not matter who's right and who's wrong. Isn't it wonderful to actually just say, look, it doesn't matter sort of who's right and who's wrong. Sort of, I care for you. I ask your forgiveness. Please forgive me. Now there is where we're getting to something which we can all recognize is very spiritual. That is religion. The idea of forgiveness, something which leads to peace and harmony, which is saying, look, I'm a human being, you're a human being. We see things in different ways, but we can still love each other. We can still live together. We can still be at peace together. We can share our home. We can share our Buddhist center. We can share our planet with you, no matter who you are. Is anything I've done to upset you? I'm sorry. When that happens, when actually somebody comes to you and us for forgiveness, it's something which is so moving, if it really comes from the heart, then you're friends again afterwards. It has to be that way. I really think it was actually the, the Anagarika, who I told this to last week, understood what I was saying, went and said sorry. And I think the other Anagarika was the one at fault. But, knowing he was at fault, but the other person asked forgiveness, made all the difference. It was a movement from the heart. That is what Dhamma is. That is what Buddhism is. The one who asks forgiveness first is the one who is right. Because they have the right perspective. Sometimes, though, it's just so hard to ask forgiveness because, I mean, they really are wrong. <laughs> And I haven't done anything. It's all their fault. It's all their fault. It's not all their fault. We have this wonderful teaching in Buddhism about the law of karma. If you've got a husband like that, it's because of your karma. <laughs> <laughs> if your wife treats that way, it's your karma. <laughs> so we think... We sometimes think, oh, it's really unfair. So just ask, say sorry. <laughs> Moving from the heart. Because who is right and who is wrong? The way we form our ideas and our views of even what happened. I read uh, when I was in Singapore recently on the aeroplane, got this very wonderful little article, some research done in the United States of these Marines 
who were being trained in withstanding torture techniques or interrogations. And just after their interrogations, the day afterwards, the psychologists were going in and saying, who was the person who did this interrogation? And they did a line-up, just like in the, the police documentaries. Line-up of these soldiers. And they'd been interrogated by these uh, you know, senior marines for about three or four hours. And they couldn't recognize who it was. In the line-ups, there's only about 30% recognition. The day before, for many hours, in the tense situation, the memory failed. Who did what? Who said what? How many arguments about who's right and who's wrong are all rely upon our memory? It's great as a Buddhist to know that your memory is uncertain. I, I haven't got Alzheimer's disease yet, but I can't remember what I talked about last week. In particular, I can't remember whether I told that story last week. <laughs> But who cares anyway? Because memory is uncertain. And you don't really know who said what and who did what. So why is it we argue so much and we can fight so much over silly things like memories about who did what? You know, the, you probably all remember the, the story called Gulliver's Travels. That sort of uh, English book uh, recorded a war which was going on with, one of them was the Lilliputians and the other ones, I forget who the other ones were. And it was all about, the war started because they couldn't decide that when you have a boiled egg, whether you should eat it from the flatter side or from the sharper side. Because you know, there's two, two sides to an egg. You know, one is actually more pointed, the other one is more sort of uh, uh, blunt. And they had a war over which side of an egg you should start eating first. Now, that actually, why is it we can go to a war? It was like a satire. Why is it we can go to a war on small things? It's because of our ego, our sense of self, our memories and our views where we attach a me to them. That's where we get into problems. That's where we get into arguments and wars. The reason why it's hard to say sorry is because of pride. Now, when we actually put a different standard upon who's right and who's wrong, the one who is actually humble, the one who actually can say sorry, the one who can actually let go of their ego for the sense of love, because isn't what, what love is all about, being selfless, egoless, not really concerning about yourself, but being more concerned about others, there is actually where we can overcome that resistance to saying sorry, that resistance to actually admitting that sometimes we're not always right. You know, sometimes people challenge you. Sometimes they can even challenge you about your religion, about your views. Can you ever say, yes, you're right and I'm wrong? It's something which I've often noticed. I think I mentioned this in, the, in my little journal, a book about insight. No one can ever think they're wrong. It's impossible. Because if you think you're wrong, you think you're right about that. <laughs> we always think we're right. The only thing we can say is we think we were wrong. But you ever notice that whatever you think, whatever you say, you naturally know that that's right. How many times has that been false? How many times have you made mistakes? In my job, I'd made mistakes so many times. It's been good fun sometimes, making mistakes as a monk. I remember this, because I did a funeral service today. I forgot to, someone was going to give us a, a talk. Uh, say something about the person who just died. I was just wrapping up, about to say go, and say, hey, I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> I remember another occasion, I was doing a funeral for, oh, an elderly Sri Lankan man who had died. And during the funeral service, I was saying, and 
so and so, it's such a great shame that you've lost your your mother and your grandmother. And she happened to be there at the service, say, I'm not dead yet, it's my husband. <laughs> That, that, that changed the whole flow of the funeral service. <laughs> and one other time when I was doing a marriage ceremony, doing a marriage ceremony, and there was this young Thai girl came in with this old uh, Australian man, and quite, quite naturally, being quite innocent as a monk, I said, oh, is that your new father-in-law? <laughs> he said, no, I'm her husband. <laughs> But fortunately, her daughter was there and said, but you're old enough to be your father-in-law, she said, and save me. <laughs> but sometimes we make a mistake. And when we make a mistake, isn't it much better to say just sorry and actually have this ego and think that we're someone who never makes mistakes? One of the great things about spiritual life is that being able to make mistakes and not always having to be right. So when we make a mistake, we say, oh yeah, I made a mistake. Or to be able to say, I don't know. You've got me there. Now that's actually the sign of like freedom. Being free to be human. Being free to be fallible. And that takes a lot of abandoning of your ego. Bigger egos never want to be wrong. And because of that, because we never want to be wrong, we actually, because of that power of ego and pride, we actually concoct life to suit ourselves. This is actually the heart of this talk. This is actually the psychology of how we make our views. We want to be right so much that we actually bend our perception, our thoughts to fit our views. We see what we want to see. We hear what we want to hear. How many times have you been talking to somebody and you ask them afterwards and you think they haven't been listening? They have been listening, but they've only been listening to what they want to hear. You talk to your dog or your cat and all they want to hear is food. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually we filter so much about what we want to hear what we want to see, what we want to feel. We bend and filter our perceptions. Anything which we don't want to hear, we won't hear. Anything which we don't want to see, we won't see. So that's actually where dogma comes from. Why there are so many different religions with different ideas? Because too many of us, we only want to hear what we want to hear, what fits our religion, what fits our views. We only want to see, we only want to know what we like to know. That's why I was having an argument with somebody just a little earlier about aliens. Do you believe in aliens? If not, why not? There could be a few in the audience this evening. <laughs> Because why not? Because for many people, especially if you're a scientist, say that's rubbish, it doesn't exist, it can't exist. You see, you're in denial. <laughs> but not, not just things like that. It's the way we form our views, the way we actually form our opinions. We start off with some sort of world view. And that actually, from that view, that's how we bend our perceptions. For example, that somebody who is like a romantic isn't love wonderful? Have you been to a, a marriage ceremony and seen this wonderful young couple? See their glittering eyes, just full of hope and full of love. Oh, isn't that, oh, isn't that just so wonderful? <laughs> I'm trying my best. <laughs> Please give me support. Because <laughs> a couple of days ago, talking about making mistakes, there's an old friend I hadn't seen for about 10 years. He was at a, at a ceremony last Wednesday. And I knew that he'd been divorced from his wife because I remember his wife and, and his children from a long time ago. And I was trying to be kind to him. I said, yeah, you know, some marriages are so much suffering. You know, it's, it's dukkha. That's a Buddhist word for dukkha. You're much better off without your wife not being married anymore. 
I didn't realise that he just got remarried earlier. <laughs> he said, that's my new wife. <laughs> she gave me a really dirty look. <laughs> but why do monks think like that? <laughs> why do people romantic? You see, because we, a lot of the times that we perceive what we want to perceive, we think what we want to think. It's all about wishful thinking or it's opposite denial. I always, this is one of my lovely stories about when you do fall in love. You all know this one. Where do people go to fall in love? They never come to the Buddhist center. This is the wrong time because monks are very unromantic. <laughs> if you want to fall in love, you go out to a nightclub or a nice romantic dinner with in candlelight or go like a walk on the esplanade under the moonlight. Do you know it's a full moon night now? Isn't that romantic? Why do people fall in love in such places? Because it's so dark you can't see <laughs> <laughs> what you're falling in love with. <laughs> no one ever falls in love in the middle of the day. If they turned up the lights in the nightclub, <laughs> you probably would stop dancing with that person. <laughs> but why is it we want that to happen? Because it's fantasy. We want to feel like that. And therefore, we're willing to go along with the delusion. Why is it all the movies, they all stop when after a long struggle, they manage to finally fall in love and live happily ever after. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> we don't want to see the sequel, do we? <laughs> now you can understand what wishful thinking is all about. Why is it that people don't like going to the cemeteries or the funerals? It's wishful thinking. I'm not going to die. We're going to die. They're going to die. I love going to cemeteries. I love going to Buddhist funerals because that's one less disciple I have to worry about. <laughs> I like an easy life. I got rid of another one today. <laughs> Went to a funeral at free battle. <laughs> so our views and opinions, where do they all come from? You see, there's a lot of wishful thinking in there. We want to avoid all the pain and suffering. We don't want to go old, get old. We don't want to sort of die. We want to fall in love. We want life to be happy. We want life to be wonderful. Now that's where a lot of views come from. Wishful thinking and denial. So if we have a religion, if I started a religion, that you, if you meditate, you will live forever. You'll never get old. That if you do this chanting, that you will meet your most wonderful partner in life. Or, <laughs> if you haven't already met them, or what you have met already will become even more beautiful, more wonderful. I can change your partner into being your ideal man, your ideal woman. Now, if I had a religion like that, you'd really love to come again and again and again. Because wishful thinking. But unfortunately, in Buddhism, we tell it as it is. Your partner is going to get older and more smelly. <laughs> <laughs> Not less. <laughs> You're going to have arguments because that's the nature of things. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? But <laughs> the point is that people don't want to hear the truth, do they? Now, this is one of the things that sometimes you've got to be very careful. You have to be honest. Religion should be truth. And truth, actually, rather than being wishful thinking, should lead to a great sense of peace and harmony. He said, we are understanding, oh yeah, this is actually our life, and this is me. This is my experience. Because truth should be according to experience. Not just faulted, just not just reason, not just thinking, but thinking, reason, with experience, all coming together. So yeah, this is truth. And there's a lot of peace which comes from understanding, yeah, this is what a marriage is like. We know that there's going to be 
difficulties, and know there's going to be trouble. There's no there's ways we can actually deal with that trouble. We're actually being realistic, being honest. We know about our bodies, the way it does go old, the way it does you know, get sick, the way we are going to leave this world. And it's much sooner than you expect. Because I'm, this year I'm 53. I'm way over halfway. <laughs> i only got a short time left now. My goodness. And many of you are much older than that. So why can't we be honest and upfront about this? And it makes you much more peaceful. It brings you more freedom. It's one, there's a friend of mine, or rather a friend of a friend, he was actually this great athlete. He was like a long distance runner and was winning everything. And people were thinking he's going to go up to the, you know, actually the, the international standard, you know, you know, Olympic Games. And then he suddenly started losing. And we asked him, why? And he said, I finally realized I didn't have to win anymore. He said, such a lot of torture having to win, having always to come first. When he got rid of that pride, his life was much more peaceful. He never became an Olympian, but he was a much, much more peaceful, relaxed, free human being. How much of our lack of freedom comes from these ideas and views. Where did they come from? Who put them inside of us? It's conditioning. You know, I really feel for like girls growing up, they have to be, you know, just so beautiful. Otherwise they feel like they're failures. Not only that, the stuff they have to put on their face, the clothes they have to wear. I remember a couple of years ago when the, the, the what's it called? You have the low trousers or skirts and the high tank tops, whatever it is, have this big um, swathe of, of, of vacant flesh <laughs> <coughs> with nothing covering it. I remember the first time I saw that I was in Melbourne. And Melbourne's a very, very cold city. <laughs> and I saw these poor young girls going around just, you know, with just this, it's almost going blue, just this. <laughs> and I felt, oh, so sorry for you. And why do you have to do that? I had so much compassion. <laughs> it felt like stopping the car and putting the robe around you to keep them warm. <laughs> and the men are the same, just what you have to do. To, we were joking t uh, today, because we're doing a lot of work at our monastery, getting it ready for the uh, range retreat entry day tomorrow. Uh, no, it's on so on um, Sunday. And I always remember the time when Ajahn Jaka was here. We used to have these busy bees at our monastery. And you get all these like men coming actually to help, you know, doing some really hard work. We'd always make sure we get some of the Thai girls to come as well. And get them to stand next to the men when they were digging. Because they'd always dig much, much harder when there was a pretty woman standing next door. <laughs> it's, it's exploitation, we knew that. But one of the things about being a monk... <laughs> I know psychology, so we know how these things work, so you can make use of them. So you get all this, <laughs> all this work out of these men because they like to impress the girl. It's, it's, it's their nature. <laughs> so, so that's actually how we built our monastery. <laughs> but when you actually know how conditioning works and psychology works, actually we know where all these, a lot of these views and ideas come from. Just conditioning, that's all. Okay, if those conditionings work for your peace, happiness, and freedom. But sometimes when the, the conditioning, when the ideas and the views lead to opposite ways, when they lead to you know, thinking that you know, if you sort of blow somebody else up, then you go up to heaven. Or when they sort of believe that you know, to convert other people is the, the highest happiness or whatever, then you know there's something that's going wrong there. A correct view, truth, who's right, has to be someone who creates peace, harmony, freedom in the world. But all of those who go to religious places never trust anybody who wants more disciples, who wants you to join. They must be absolutely crazy. The more disciples you have, the more times of an evening somebody rings you up, Ajahn Brahm, I'm in trouble, Ajahn Brahm, 
So if I had an argument, Ajahn Brahm, I'm going crazy, Ajahn Brahm, I want to commit suicide, Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> sometimes, this is true, sometimes my tea is cold before I can actually start to drink it. So for the last 20 years I've been trying to get rid of disciples. A good, <laughs> a good teacher is always one who wants to get rid of you. It's on it. That's what you do at school, at university. Even a good doctor that wants to get you out of the surgery. A good psycho- psychologist or therapist wants to free you so you don't have to come back again. So a good monk wants to get rid of you all. I've been trying for so many years. I must be a terrible teacher because you keep coming back some of you every, fr- every Friday. <laughs> but you see, it's freedom and, and peace and truth. Those are the things which is really right. Anything which is like trying to grab you and keep you. There's something wrong there and you feel there's something wrong there. Trust those instincts because those instincts are very, very often your best safeguard. So you know what's right if it gives you freedom, peace and happiness. One of the reasons this place has become very successful is because no one needs to come here. We don't ring you up on a Friday night and say, I didn't see you here last week. (laughs) (laughs) Where have you been? (laughs) We don't take your names. We don't give you curses in case you don't come, although I threatened that a few times, only for a joke though. (laughs) So, because of that, that sort of people feel that there's a freedom there. When there's not that freedom, there'll be the force, either force coming from your own, what you want to believe or what you don't want to believe, or the force coming from what you're pushed on, onto you, what you're compelled to believe. And that's not freedom. What's right has to come from experience, from truth, from clear seeing, from free seeing. So, I usually give not only just the Uh, the criteria that it has to lead to peace, to freedom, to happiness, to be truth. But it also has to stand up to clear seeing, clear um, understanding, clear viewing. And by clear viewing, I mean when you take away all your desires and all your fears, all your wants and not wants. So truth has to stand up to clear seeing. So you're not seeing what you want to see. You're not denying what you don't want to see. But you're courageous in actually seeing what's really there. Sometimes it takes encouragement from somebody else. That's what encouragement is. Somebody else sits up here and gives you courage to be truthful to yourself, to your life, to who you are. To be at peace with yourself, with who you are. And your life. And this life. And that sort of encouragement, that courage, is nothing else than the old wonderful word of love. To open the door of your heart to life, and to yourself, and to the truth of this moment. Instead of wanting it to be different, allowing this to be. Allowing you to be. Allowing your loved ones to be. Even today, allowing your loved ones to die. Now that is the truth which is a liberating, a freeing truth. A love which attaches, which controls, is always coming from a sense of not seeing correctly, not seeing truly. Can you really control your own body and your own life and your own death? It's great to think that we can choose the time we die, but that's not really the case. It's just like being in a boat and someone says, your time's up, come in. And you're never ready. We're never really ready to die. It just sneaks up on us and catches us, for most of people, unawares, unready, with unfinished business. But instead of saying that, we can have this beautiful sense of being at peace with life, working with life, being with life, rather than always trying to be against it. That is where we have the freedom. That is where we have the happiness. We can allow arguments to be we can enjoy them. We can allow sometimes the pains of sickness to be. We can make use of them. And whenever there's a problem, the trouble, you know the simile which I've said here many times, stepping in the dog poo. We allow even the dog poo 
of life to be. Because that is very important. What else do you expect the dog to do? Where else can, <laughs> where else can it go? <laughs> so sometimes, by the law of nature, you know, you'll step in it from time to time. But we always remember that simile, whenever you step in the dog poo, always take it back to your garden and dig it into your garden under your mango tree. And so when your mango has its fruits, when you're tasting the delicious mangoes, always remember where that sweet taste came from. It came from the dog poo. Because <laughs> there is lots of dog poo in life, as many of you know. You've had lots of tragedies already in your life, things which you'd rather not happen. You know, deaths of loved ones, things gone wrong, blah, blah, blah. I had a great tragedy in my life. It was about 10, 11 years ago when the previous abbot left. And I had to be the abbot in his place. Oh, that was a lot of dog poo. <laughs> had to deal with. So what we're saying there is, doesn't matter what you've got in life, if it's real truth, if you've got it right, who's right is whether you can make use of that, whether you can embrace it, whether instead of actually allowing it to sort of create misery, depression, upset in your life, you can actually make use of it and grow from it. That's why all pain is called growing pain. This is what pain actually is. It's there for us to grow and become better people. Yeah, it's tough at the time. Dog poo smells. But the right view, the correct view, what truth really is, is something which will say, yeah, dog poo is... Pain is, but we can actually make use of it and become better people as a result. At a funeral service, yeah, it's painful to actually to lose someone you've known for so long. But that's growing pain. It will teach you to appreciate the ones you're with even more when you know that they too one day will go there. People ask me about that very often, the truth of things. In Buddhism, what happens when you die? I usually give the answer, you go to one of two places when you die. Fremantle or Karakata. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Apparently there's a third place now, Pinaru. So you've got three places to go now when you die. <laughs> the, point, the, the point is, it's being honest and being truthful. And if you're really honest and truthful, if it really is truth, if it's really right, it creates that peace and harmony and gives you something to work with in life. So when we're actually talking about truth, right religion or whatever, it's not what's in theories and books which, is not to be u which can't be really used. It's not something which people argue with. That's why when somebody says Buddhism is this and doesn't agree with that and they create arguments and trouble, then they're missing the point somewhere. One of the sayings of the Buddha is he said, I never argue with the world. The world argues with me he says, but I don't argue back with the world. Very powerful statement said by the Buddha. What does that actually mean? I think I've explained much of what it meant in this talk this evening. How the world can argue with you, but you don't argue with the world. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. You're the one, oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to make your life any worse or harm you. I forgive. I want to be your friend. You say that forgiveness, eventually, to life. Life, I forgive you for taking away my loved one in death. Life, I forgive you for giving me cancer. Life, I forgive you for making me abbot. <laughs> <laughs> because if you don't forgive life, you're arguing about life and arguing with life all the time. Where does that leave you? Can you really argue with life and get angry at life? That's what a lot of people do. That's called grief, guilt, you know, the anger they have to other people, wars. So when we actually can sort of be truthful to life, truthful to ourselves, then you will find at least does lead to peace and harmony. Okay, you may be sick. Okay, you may not be so intelligent. You may not be so... Uh, so beautiful as an next person. You may not be so rich. You may not be such a good speaker. You may not be such a good monk. 
but hang on, that's who you are. So why not you become peace with who you are? Strange thing happens when we become peace with who we are. When we say forgiveness to life, we say life, the door of my heart is open to you, as you are. We're becoming realistic. With that realism, the peace comes, the freedom comes, and strangely, growth comes. We do become better people with that degree of correct view. Because we don't get so angry, we don't get grieving, we don't get upset, we don't sort of want things which life can never give us. I was being reminded today about a picture which I have of my teacher, Ajahn Chah, in my room at Serpentine. It's one of my favourite pictures of my teacher because he's imitating this um, image, this statue in a monastery in Thailand with a caption underneath, Joy at last to know there's no happiness in the world. <laughs> as well as Zen-like sayings, joy at last to know there's no happiness in the world. What it really means, not there's no happiness, but there's no permanent happiness. Sometimes you're having a good day, sometimes it doesn't go so well, sometimes it rains, sometimes it shines, sometimes things go wonderfully well, sometimes everything goes wrong. Welcome to life. Joy at last to be at peace with this. Joy at last to have that view that this is the way of our world. We do have arguments, but we can always say sorry. We can be at peace. We can have that view which accepts life as it is. Understanding that everything has its place. Just like that simile I gave recently about our monastery at Serpentine. I've seen so much growth in that forest over 21 years, but there's still many dead trees. When I first moved there, I wanted to cut down all those dead trees until I was told, quite correctly, that those dead trees give nests for the birds and for the possums live in the, the hollows of those trees. Each one of those dead trees is important for the ecology of a forest. Not only that, but the ants, the white ants, everything in that forest has a purpose. It's very necessary to be there. Even the flies in November are very important. I realized that much of the things which I, first of all, I didn't like, which I wanted to cut down and destroy, I realized how important they all were. Just as in a forest, so you. There's many things in yourself which you maybe want to cut down and destroy because you find them irritating. But with the right view of correctness, you realize that much of that is very important. You may not realize it now, but some of the things which have gone wrong in your life are some of the greatest blessings. Some of the things which you don't like in yourself are part of you. Just like not liking those dead trees, they are an important part of the ecology of you. Now I can accept that forest as it is. Allow it to grow in its own natural way. And it's a beautiful forest now. There are many birds, there are many possums and other animals who live in those trees. In the same way, you can be at peace with yourself. All those things you're trying to get rid of. Why? All those things, parts of life, you say, I'd rather this didn't happen. Why? Can't we change our view to be one which creates more peace, more freedom, more harmony? Harmony with others, harmony with life, and harmony with ourselves. Peace, love, the door of my heart, open to life. All of life, the sicknesses, the pain, and the death. The joy and the arguments the differences of opinion. Can't we embrace all of that? Then, you're right. <coughs> so that's what we mean by who's right and who's wrong. We use our experience of life, use our reason, that which leads to peace, to truth, to freedom. When we follow those criteria, then we know who's right. So there is a talk for this evening.
who's right. So any questions or arguments <laughs> about this evening's talk? Yeah, go on. Okay, if you've got someone like that, it's best to run away. Because <laughs> that will lead to peace, <laughs> to freedom. Eventually, the, you know, someone actually teaches them a little lesson and they, they learn themselves. A lot of that is just because of fear, fear of themselves. You know, they're all, too many people are control freaks and we control in just weird ways. And sometimes because we can't really, you know, just be ourselves, just we bully others. And we're just, you know, narciss narcissistic, whatever it is. And it's, again, it's all just control freaks. If you want to know the essence of Buddhism, it's actually changed from being a control freak but to being free. Instead of controlling ourselves and controlling others, we allow our life to be. We're free. We can actually blend into things. We can disappear. Our ego disappears into the blending of nature. We melt away. That's a wonderful thing to do. So we don't need to bully anybody. But common sense, you can always run away if <laughs> they're a bully. Okay, next question. It's last time for questions. You have to wait three months <laughs> for the next question. Okay, so, okay, go on. Are your views the results of your karma? In a sense, yes. Because our calm is like our conditioning. And we actually create our views from our conditioning. <coughs> and the thing is that we can, through that understanding, the way we condition our views, we can actually decondition them, we can free them. Which is a great, um, a wonderful truth that freedom is actually possible. That you know, we can actually overcome, we can let go of that karma which makes us always you know, think in a certain way or act in a certain way. So I said last week, why is it that many of you always sit in the same place when you come here? Don't look at me because I've got no choice. I have to sit up here. <laughs> <laughs> but we can actually change. You know, why do you sit there? Why do you come here? We can actually change. And it's a mindfulness and the opening of our minds makes us actually change. We can free ourselves. And for many people their life is a more of a freeing. Seeing some of the, the conditioned views and freeing them. So we're not always doing things the same old way. Why did you ask that question? Why do you put your hair like that? Why do you wear that type of clothes? Listen to that type of music? listen to that type of TV or eat that type of muesli. You should be like a monk, live on the wild side. <laughs> <laughs> do, do things differently. <laughs> okay, thank you for that question. I know it was too deep a question to answer fully, but I just said a few words and thank you. Okay, I think that's enough for this evening and for the next couple of months, but... Those of you who want to listen to a little bit more, there are some talks which are going to be held on a Friday night from distinguished visitors to broaden your understanding about Buddhism by hearing the Dharma taught from people from different temples, different monasteries. So that's going to be happening on a Friday night. But if you really are hungry for one of our monks on, what is it, August the 14th, you're all invited to, to hear another talk from me, a special, because of my book launch. Coming soon, in a temple near you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, do you want to give the rest of the announcements?